The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. We are all beyond fed up with this pandemic, and some think we should forget lockdowns and just let her rip. Tonight, we will debate that controversial idea. Then we've got writer Ethan Liu on his new book and precarious journey into the world of cryptocurrency as a Bitcoin miner. It's Wednesday, January 12th, and that's all ahead on the agenda. Nearly two years into living with COVID-19, there is a definite disappointment and fatigue in the land that we somehow haven't been able to put this definitively behind us yet. We have one of the highest vaccination rates in the world. We have closed schools and businesses and stayed home. And yet COVID persists, perhaps more virulently than ever. Is it time for a different approach? Let's ask our guests. And as is our custom, we'll introduce them from furthest away to closest to our studio, starting in Boca Raton, Florida, with Peter Sherman. He's the host of the podcast, Sherman Unlimited, and a former progressive conservative member of the Ontario legislature. In Hamilton, Ontario, Sarah Fung, registered nurse and co-host of the Gritty Nurse podcast. And back here in Ontario's capital city, Dr. Peter Uni, scientific director of the Ontario COVID-19 Science Advisory Table and a professor of medicine and epidemiology at the University of Toronto. And Jan De Silva, chief executive officer of the Toronto Region Board of Trade. And it's great to have you four on TVO tonight for a discussion that I want to start with a very open-ended question here. However you would describe what Ontario's approach has been for the past 22 months, I ask each of you, is it time for a different approach to fighting COVID-19? Peter, start us off if you would. Radically different. Um, in, in my view, looking at what's happened over the past two years, uh, and it's not always the popular view, um, I, I happen to think that Ontario's done very well. I think that the Ford government uh, taking baby steps at first and, and being maybe overzealous with lockdowns uh, helped us an awful lot two years ago. The difficulty that we're in now is uh, that um, oft-used expression, uh, wash, lather, rinse, repeat. If it worked two years ago, it must be okay for this time. And I don't think that's true. And we see it looking uh, around the United States, particularly where I happen to be for the past uh, month or five weeks. And I know a lot of people with this illness and, uh, and the scope of it. And uh, I don't think it warranted what we did. And, uh, and I think that uh, the damage, the collateral damage, and I'm talking now about our kids and uh, the, the whole issue of businesses, people with huge mortgages on their house to try to keep the business alive. I think that damage is going to be far worse than Omicron would have brought to us. Jan De Silva, your view. I think we need to stop addressing COVID as a short-term issue. Two years in, clearly there's no finish line in sight. And for the business community, we need to be, yes, continuing to focus on vaccination, but also putting every additional layer of protection in place to keep our businesses open, to enable us to continue to gather and meet. This bottom of the ninth approach to the pandemic is simply not helping us, and we're looking for those additional protection layers. Okay, I have, I have, there, there's been a method to my madness here. I've wanted to hear from the quote unquote civilians first before we get to the medical people. And now Sarah Fung, let's hear what you have to say on this. Uh, I think the approach over the past two years has been haphazard at best. Um, there is a lot of evidence out there, uh, a lot of learnings that came out of SARS, if you remember back to 2002, 2003. And uh, one of the things I think we should have been looking at from the beginning is a precautionary principle. So at the beginning, when we didn't know a lot about COVID and how it was spread, I think we should have treated it as though it was airborne and put all those precautions into place until we learn more. So, and even in terms of the school shutdowns, I believe we're on our fourth shutdown now. I have two kids that are in school and this has been really, in, it's really impacted them in a negative way. And I think at this point, those of us that have done everything we should be doing should be allowed some more freedoms. And in terms of getting back to quote unquote, um, re regular pre-pandemic life, I think that's something we need to focus on. Okay, Dr. Peter Uni, let's hear what you have to say on that score. 
Oh, I think it's inevitable. Things are changing. It's changing now with Omicron. Omicron is this last really big challenge. We need to be very careful that our uh, healthcare system doesn't get overwhelmed. We need to be aware of that we did actually tremendously well during the last few waves, including the Delta wave. This worked absolutely fabulously actually in terms of you know being slow and steady this approach worked and now what will happen after omicron is that nearly everybody will have had some immunity uh, quite a few people unfortunately through infection only but, but quite a lot of us through a combination of infection and vaccination or just vaccination and this will change the face of the pandemic and we will not have the same challenges to face anymore than what we're having right now right now it's a few more weeks, but it's not for long. All right, let me do another round with the four of you because I, I'm hearing various degrees of uh, relative unhappiness with the way the current Ontario government has approached this. And I guess, Peter, if I were to ask you, tell me one thing about the current Ontario government's approach that you think needs to be changed right away. What's that one thing? Uh, open everything up, the, bus the business aspects and the school aspects. Now, now, I know school is going back into session next week. That's great for the kids, but uh, business has to operate as well, and um, and I'd like to see it go forward that way. Jan De Silva, one thing the government ought to change today. Look, we've got a health crisis that's being enabled by a data crisis. The frustrations that our businesses have is that there's no proof points that the gym or the restaurant or the small retailer was the cause of the outbreak. So expanding the Verify Ontario app to have more robust contact tracing and exposure notification would give us much needed data to better put steps in place and to help businesses understand why measures that are being put in place are required. Sarah Fung, one thing they should change today. Uh, the government needs to first and foremost repeal Bill 124, which, as you know, caps the wages of nurses and other public servants at uh, less than 1% over the next three years. So this is something that has been hugely disempowering to nurses at a time where we were being hailed as healthcare heroes. Um, we haven't really seen any tangible steps towards improving our situation. Uh, nurses are leaving in unprecedented numbers, and this is really affecting the healthcare system. So you might have heard about entire emergency departments closing for weekends at a time. So this is already impacting healthcare. And when the government is talking about increasing bed spaces, that's great. But is there a nurse, is there a healthcare provider at the end of the day to look after these patients that are sicker and coming in with uh, issues related to Omicron? Let me do a fast follow up on that, Sarah, because I want to understand. Are you saying that if Bill 124 were repealed and that this insistence on bringing in public sector contracts, no more than 1% settlements. If, for example, nurses could get three or four or 5% increases in their contracts, are you, are, are you pretty much guaranteeing us that we wouldn't be seeing the exodus from the profession that we are right now? I think you'd see a vast improvement. So when we're talking about the cap on wages, we're talking about a cap at a time where inflation is you know, increasing rapidly. So it is about the money, but First and foremost, I think it's more about the respect that nurses are owed. And part of that is allowing us to be able to bargain freely. And for all of the work that we do every single day, we're taking a risk on the job. We're dealing with increased incidences of verbal and physical abuse. And I think this is a slap in the face that uh, this legislation has been imposed on us. So I think it would greatly help the situation. Okay. Now, Peter Uni, I, I, uh, how do I put this? I appreciate the fact I don't want to put you in a sticky situation here because you are at one of the most significant tables that advises the current premier and his cabinet on what to do. But and, and so I'm not asking you to violate any confidences about the advice that you give. Uh, but I still would be curious to get your take on whether you think there's one thing in particular we ought to be doing differently now from what we've been doing over the last 22 months. Oh, look, one of the of the aspects which is important now is that schools reopen next week. And that's important, you know, that we now just uh, do two things. We get students back to school. We, this will be a bumpy road, but it's possible. We hopefully continue with uh, vaccinating also a lot of the kids, 5 to 11 year old. And then the other part is we just need to stabilize now hospital occupancy and ICU occupancy. That's the next task at hand. And obviously, you know, we're better staffing would help there but you know the point is not to use schools anymore as a lever to control the pandemic and that's about to happen now
And let me do a quick follow up with you here as well, because we, uh, I think we've heard that we've vaccinated almost 80 percent of Ontarians, which is a pretty good number, relatively speaking. Uh, and that should dramatically reduce, um, if not the numbers of people who get infected, then certainly the severity of the disease in, in how they experience it and certainly the number Absolutely. of deaths as well. So my question is, given that we don't have a very large part of the population that is still unvaccinated, should we open up society a lot more and, you'll forgive the expression, just let her rip and let people get their immunity however they get it? No, it's not possible, you know. What Peter was saying is not realistic for Ontario. The point is, if we now would let it rip, our hospital occupancy would just increase far too much. And, you know, if somebody like Peter then is having a heart attack, God forbid, then they won't get the care anymore that they actually would need to. Right now, we just need to stabilize numbers. We need to ride out this wave. That's for sure the case. And at the end of the wave, nearly everybody will have had some immunity. But right now, the numbers of unvaccinated, even though we were tremendously successful, you know, despite structural disadvantages with a lot of, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, ethnic diversity, etc., which makes it more difficult to get to, uh, to a high vaccine coverage with it tremendously well. We still need to make sure that all those who are not immune are moved into immunity now without overwhelming the healthcare system. Needs a little bit longer, but not that much. Well, not to be too glib about this, but I've known Peter for a long time, and he tends to give heart attacks as opposed to get them. Uh, but maybe, <laughs> Peter, I could get you to respond to those comments from Dr. Uni, who says, if we do what you say, our hospitals and ICUs will be overwhelmed, and that'll be a bigger problem. Well, I respect Dr. Uni. I've spoken to him a number of times, and he's he's the right guy at the right time at the right table. So I don't want to get into a head-to-head -head on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, I've interviewed a couple of people in the last two weeks who are uh, serious uh, physicians in other places. One who has a master's in public health as well as being a microbiologist, an epidemiologist, uh, has a couple of PhDs, uh, and is looking at uh, an area of Southern California that has been uh, massively affected and it says, no, there's not much you're going to do about this. Everybody's going to get this thing. Sooner or later, everybody is. If my, myself, sitting here in Florida, over the course of the last weekend, we saw 70,000 cases. Now, I know nobody wants to talk about cases anymore, Dr. Uni. They want to talk about hospitalizations, as do you, and I understand that. And I'm looking at the headroom. In other words, the number of ICU beds, for example, that remain available at the present time. And I think in Ontario, if I'm not mistaken, it's around five. I also looked at statistics uh, from Delta going back into September, um, August area, and I looked them at them in Florida, which is a state of 22 million. Um, they had 17,000 hospitalizations at one point. Right now, it's in the area of 10 or 11,000. And uh, I'm also told by a number of experts, and, and you just mentioned it yourself, alluded to it anyway, that we're probably between two and four weeks away from seeing this thing take a curve that just slides right down. So so we're not dealing with a disease, though it's called COVID-19, that's anything like what Delta was, much less the original COVID that came our way two years ago. Let me get Dr. Unity to respond, and then I'll get the others in as well. Remember, it's a numbers game. And, uh, you know, one thing that distinguishes us, luckily, from Florida or California is that our immunity through infection is lower, meaning also we had a lot less deaths. And the point right now is just you need to be aware of that. A lot of what's happening in our ICUs and also just in our acute care wards is not dominated by COVID, luckily so, but a lot of, uh, of beds are occupied by people who need to be there, who need to receive their their care and this needs to continue to happen right now and the point really is we need to ride out this wave but we can't have a high very short wave otherwise we're in trouble we need to prolong all of this a bit so that our healthcare system is really just about to be able to deal with it and uh, we're just at the edge of that all right Jan De Silva you've heard the arguments do you think business is capable uh, given the plans that are in place right now uh, to ride out what might be another two or three weeks of status quo, can business handle that? 
Look, clearly we need to. That's what's required at this point in time. But where we keep coming back to stepping away from treating this as a short-term situation and putting more layers of protection in place, the reality in our regional economy is that 51% of our workers need to be physically on site. So it's simply not sufficient to say, okay, for a couple of weeks, let's just work from home to, to kind of reduce contact. We need to put layers of protection in place. Restaurants, let's understand if there's ventilation or airborne-related issues that we could put mitigations in place. Our hospitals, our um, police services, our logistics providers, we all need to be looking at how do we keep those workplace environments as safe as possible to avoid absenteeism and to try to keep the economy functioning. Well, that's the key, Jan. I wonder, are, are, how confident are you that businesses could open up again, take all the restrictions off small business in particular, which are suffering a disproportionate amount of the damage compared to bigger businesses, big box stores in particular. How confident are you that uh, we could do that and, and not overrun our hospitals or ICUs? No, with all with all uh, deference to Dr. Uni, fully agree. We've got a challenge with our healthcare system in this province and in other provinces in Canada. It's simply not elastic. It's fixed. We've got fixed capacity, and at points like this where we're seeing an over flooding of utilization of the healthcare system, we do need to take these steps. But what I would go back to, let's talk, Steve, about the small businesses you're referring to. A big challenge we have is we've had inconsistencies of approach. The federal government has said federally regulated uh, businesses require, need to require vaccine mandates for on-the-job workers. The province has simply said, for those businesses that don't fall under federal regulations, you decide what you want to do. And employment lawyers are saying, well, you've got risks, Ontario businesses, if you're trying to put uh, protocols in place for your on-the-job workers. So we've got a challenge right now where we need to have harmonization of mitigations to help businesses remain open. We can't have a mishmash of rules and approaches because it's simply not helpful as Dr. Uni and the scientific advisory table are trying to advise the province and as Sarah and our healthcare professionals are trying to treat the illness. Well, let me ask Sarah about a development that happened in her sector yesterday, which was the announcement by Ontario's health minister that I think the number was about 15,000 nurses that are trained elsewhere in other jurisdictions, but who very much want to be part of the healthcare solution here in Ontario right now. And they have been waiting for their accreditation, their licensing in order to be able to participate as nurses in our system and until now have not been able to. Okay, if that door opens and we can actually deploy those nurses, how much of a difference do you think it'll make? I'm glad you brought that up because that's something that I've been pushing for for a long time. A lot of internationally trained nurses spend years and thousands of dollars trying to get licensed in Ontario for jobs they may have done for 15 or 20 years in their home country. And many of them give up and end up working as PSWs or working in minimum wage jobs. So this will be uh, hugely important. It's a good step in the right direction. When we're looking in terms of numbers, 15,000 internationally educated nurses, there are about uh, you know, 400,000 nurses uh, across Canada. So it is going to help. I do feel like, again, this is a short-term solution to a larger problem, but I hope that um, we can use internationally trained health professionals more effectively in the future. So if we can train these nurses up to start working in hospitals quickly, that will be a great step. Um, however, I did look at the report and it does say that these nurses still need to work under supervision of a preceptor. And with the current shortage we have now, is that possible? Are there gonna be enough nurses on the unit that can actually get these internationally trained nurses up to speed? And that's to be determined, I think. Dr. Uni, maybe you can give us some insight into this because um, given your responsibilities, you have seen how either quickly or slowly government reacts to problems. This seems to be a solution that so many voices have been calling for for a long time. And here we are 22 months into this pandemic and it is only now happening. How come? Uh, to be honest with you, for me, it was always, you know, I'm, I'm as you know, I'm Swiss, no? And for me, when, when we uh, arrived here, it was always very difficult to understand how protectionist the Canadian system is in general with medically qualified personnel, as an example. And, and um, I don't understand the politics behind there, but I would believe, you know, that we have a lot of uh, medically qualified staff out there who would actually be much better positioned, you know, as part of 
of uh, of uh, resolving the issues that we're having with staffing right now. And this, of course, includes nurses. And I think this needs a certain extent of pragmatism. It took a long time, but I would hope that things are changing and that, you know, Canada is learning from the situation right now. There's always this issue coming up of, you know, variation in quality, but this can be addressed relatively uh, in a relatively uncomplicated manner. From my perspective, and that's very limited, this hasn't been always the case. I've been here for six years and I've seen a lot of loopholes um, uh, opening and a lot of roadblocks, etc., which perhaps could be resolved much more easily. Okay. Let me raise the issue of our schools because uh, a lot of parents obviously were uh, quite pleased to hear at the beginning of the year that the schools were supposed to open on the first Wednesday in the first week of January. And then, of course, we got this announcement that they wouldn't be opening for a couple of weeks. And, um, well, I, I know a lot of parents were very frustrated and disturbed to hear about that. So the schools are supposed to reopen on Monday, but they've been closed since the beginning of the year. And Peter Sherman, I want you to sort of help us get our head around the question of why it made sense to close schools, but keep malls open where all the kids who are locked out of school are probably going to be congregating. Well, the short answer is it didn't, at least not to me. Uh, it, it's been, what? eight years since I left uh, Queen's Park. And the problems that uh, you just discussed, for example, with Dr. Uni remain the same. Personnel uh, could be uh, taken from uh, other disciplines or more correctly, other, other spaces. People who are here in the old uh, caricature of the doctor driving a cab and talking to you because we don't create the residency spaces. When it really comes, this is all about money. Uh, it's it's not about schools and it's not about businesses. It's about we could we could address it all with money. Um, we haven't opened the Canada Health Act uh, in 50 years for a major overhaul in terms of how we transfer funds so that provinces can do the things that they have to do. If you have the appropriate number of medical people, so as Sarah mentioned, uh, you could you could bring 15,000 nurses in. If you didn't have Bill 124, particularly being brought in at this time, where I understand that uh, the inflation rate in the last month is running at about 7%, if you didn't have those kinds of things, if you had the latitude for uh, the province to modify the medical uh, delivery system so that we had doctors who are foreign trained coming into the system quicker. If we had more beds, which I know they're trying to create uh, at the Ontario level, but uh, we're not doing on a national level with national dollars, a lot of things would change. So to bring it back to your question about schools, schools is, uh, to me, it's about the mental health of parents, but it's even more about the mental health of kids. You do a little um, back of the napkin math and you say a kid who was born three years ago was one when COVID started. So the last two years of his or her life have been spent in a situation that is completely abnormal. So you've got a three-year-old running around who has no idea, or four-year-old has no idea what the world is really like being with other kids because they ha haven't spent enough time with them. And I think uh, when when you're looking at what outweighs um, what one thing outweighs another thing, the mental health of kids. Um, and, and that is uh, stimulated by having them in a normal or as normal as possible environment in schools is the most important thing. I think it's paramount. That, that coupled with business uh, is, is the whole, um, I guess, moving part assembly of this machine. And we're not doing what we should be doing at this time. Sarah, in your view, should the schools have been closed as long as they have been? Absolutely not. It's been hugely stressful personally for me. I have a four-year-old and a six-year-old. And to have schools open and shut so many times, I've had to scramble to figure out childcare. I've had to figure out how to work with two kids now in online school. Um, it's It's been hugely impactful to their mental and their physical health because they're sitting in front of screens all day. So where are they getting their physical exercise? Um, I think that we should be using this opportunity to make schools safer so to make sure that there are HEPA filters in every classroom, to make sure that there are enough N95 masks for teachers and for students, to make rapid testing equitable and accessible is huge. Because at this point in time, we've, you know, a lot of parents and students have done everything right. And if they had more access to rapid tests, they could use, you know, their personal judgment to make a risk assessment as to whether they want to put their kids back in school or not. And I think that my kids have, they don't even know what a regular school year is. And I don't think, I think that's really sad. I've even had to make the decision to not put my daughter who's in JK into online school because I physically can't handle that. And I, I don't think that's a choice I should have had to make. 
I don't want to invade your privacy here, but uh, how concerned are you about whether your kids will be able to catch up on whatever educational experiences they've missed, uh, both in terms of socialization or the curriculum? I am concerned. This is very concerning. Like my kids have had assessments in the fall and they're both behind. I don't know if this would have happened if um, schools hadn't been shut down. So this is, I honestly, it's, it's shameful and it's embarrassing to me as a parent that my kids are behind now and I don't know if there's anything else that I could have done differently for them. Jan, I wonder if you could speak to this issue in terms, less in terms of, of the effects on, on uh, kids, which we know is significant, but obviously if, if parents who are running businesses can't take their kids to school, what happens to that part of our economy? Oh. Look, clearly it's put a lot of stress on our workforces, without a doubt. And I think it comes back to, Steve, what I was saying off the top. The root cause challenge here is we keep continuing to approach the pandemic as a short-term issue. Two years in, there are mitigations that we could be putting in place, just as we're calling for for businesses, the same could apply for schools. Sarah pointed to rapid testing, looking at the ventilation systems within the schools. Anything we can do to put protective layers in place so we can keep the schools open is critical for the mental health and social development and educational development of our kids, but also for the uh, reducing the stress on our workforces. Dr. Uni, before I get you to comment, I guess one of the things I want to put on the record here is that even in Chicago, where the mayor of Chicago got elected in large measure because of the significant support she got from teacher unions, she had this to say the other day because she and the teacher unions are on the opposite side of this issue. This is Lori Lightfoot, the mayor of Chicago. I will not allow the Chicago Teachers Union to take our children hostage, she said at a news conference Wednesday. This is last week. I will not allow them to compromise the future of this generation of Chicago public school students. That is not going to happen. She also dismissed the demand for more testing. We are not going to rob parents of their right and their obligation to tell us if they want testing or not on their children. She said, it's not going to happen. It's morally wrong. Uh, I, I think, Dr. Uni, almost every other jurisdiction of significance, if you want to compare it to a big city like Toronto or Ottawa, in American states, they have all tried to keep their schools open. I see Boston uh, yesterday closed their schools, but that's because of uh, cold, not because of COVID. Our governments have made the decisions to keep our schools closed longer than any other jurisdiction in North America. Was that a wise decision in your view? No, as you probably know, you know, the science table was uh, quite vocal about the issue of schools, that we shouldn't use schools as a lever to control the pandemic. And we indeed are an outlier in North America. And I'm glad to see that this won't happen anymore. So if the last two weeks, this was a really difficult decision, you know, for people, if the last two weeks or the, the current two weeks actually are used to make schools safer, as pointed out by Sarah, that's what is OK. And then we just move on and just open them again. What is important is to, to realize this time we really have the higher risk settings all closed, like restaurants, for example, whereas the lower risk settings such as retail are still open. And I think it was justifiable provided that it was just this short time frame and it was used to bring HEPA filters into classroom, masks to teachers and students, etc. But now it's really important to open because of the damage that is done. One comment regarding rapid tests. Unfortunately, rapid tests don't work as well anymore as before, and we need new approaches, perhaps also for rapid tests. We're currently looking into that. Far too low sensitivity now to detect infectious cases with Omicron. Therefore, what worked before with Delta and with other variants doesn't work anymore, unfortunately. All right, let me do this follow up with you. And again, I preface the question by saying we understand that you're an advisor, not the decider. You advise and the premier and the government decide. OK, it, it, if I'm hearing you correctly, there is concern that if we just let her rip, our hospitals and our intensive care units will be overrun with patients and we don't have the capacity to deal with that right now. So my question is, we've had 22 months at this. We've had 22 months in which to improve capacity that we have known has been a problem for a long time. Why haven't we done anything about that? 
That's very simple. Um, and when you ask this question, you just point towards the fact that you haven't understood exponential growth. So even in my home country, Switzerland, completely privileged, much more healthcare around, many more beds in ICUs, etc. The healthcare system will be overwhelmed once you're in exponential growth. You know, our case counts of Omicron doubled, you know, um, now we can't measure it even anymore, doubled every five to seven days, meaning you just need to wait another seven days and then case counts are high enough that your healthcare system gets overwhelmed again. If you're in a wave like that, you need to plant it and then ride it out that you are at the level that the healthcare system still can deal with it. Of course, we need to deal with the health healthcare system longer term. You know, in OECD statistics, Canada is always at the tail end of the distribution of Western countries. Something needs to be done about that. Won't be fixable in a moment. Even if we had twice as many beds, we couldn't let it rip. That's the conclusion. All right. Peter Sherman, your view on whether or not... Uh, I understand what uh, Dr. Uni had to say there, but on the issue of capacity, have we made, in your judgment, the decisions that needed to be made that that notwithstanding those numbers, we could have improved capacity at the very least? Well, I think, number one, we should have been uh, working steadily to improve capacity, considering people, including Dr. Uni, telling uh, interviewers like myself that this wasn't going to go away anytime soon and that one day, hopefully it's a soon day, um, it would become endemic. Well, if we've had the two years uh, and we've had those kinds of warnings, why haven't we, um, I won't use the term exponentially, I'll leave that for the medical profession to talk about in terms of, of cases, um, but why haven't we... Um, in some multiple improved the capacity of our hospital system. When it was summertime, um, a couple of um, uh, tents, I guess uh, field hospitals you could call them, were erected at uh, GTA hospitals in parking lots where we could expand capacity. I think they were taken away. Uh, now we've got a, a situation where uh, the concern expressed by uh, Dr. Uni on behalf of the science table is, you know, if this goes exponential, we're in real trouble. And I understand that. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, my personal experience sitting down here in Florida, and I recognize that this is a, a high temperature, summer-like climate all the time versus a winter-like climate. I don't know if that makes any difference. I'll tell you this. They have not had any control whatsoever. This is the wide open uh, Omicron, and it was wide open Delta, wide open all the way through. They've never locked anybody down. They've got a governor who doesn't believe in that. So uh, his his take on the whole thing is personal responsibility. You watch yourself. So frankly, uh, that's what I do. It's what my wife does. We haven't been touched by COVID. On the other hand, we've got personal family members, one of them right now, two of them last week, all kinds of people that we know, at least a dozen, who have either gone through this or are going through it now. Nobody's gone to the hospital. And the hospital peak in July is uh, 150% of what it is now here in Florida. I ask myself if those those numbers are, are capable of being transposed to Ontario. Have we taken the right tack? And I'm, I'm questioning it to a great extent. Well, Dr. Uni's got this look on his face, which suggests, uh, yes, the weather makes a big difference. So go ahead, Dr. Uni, come on in. First of all, the weather makes a big difference indeed. And I don't have to talk to Peter about that. Uh, we, we agree on that. You know, if you're indoors, you're in trouble. But, you know, when you look at Florida and the numbers, the excess mortality, etc., Florida is a disaster. Um, it's clear that uh, a lot of that was preventable before. We went a completely different, down a different road, and we now just need to go through the end of this road means we just need to get everybody who is not uh, in, in has been not infected yet and not vaccinated and get them into the state of immunity. And this means right now we just need to be more careful than Florida also with our healthcare resources for a few more weeks. It's a completely different trajectory. And this means our deaths were lower, the burden of disease was lower, etc. And we did a lot better than Florida, even, even though Florida was privileged if it comes to the weather. They didn't make much of it. All right, we've got just a few minutes left here. And again, consistent with the theme that we're exploring here, should we have done things differently? Sarah, let me ask you about this. Uh, you know that in the long-term care sector in particular, but also some hospitals around Ontario, they have been saying to their employees, if you don't get vaccinated, sorry, you, you're gone. You can't come to work. There's an independent member of the Ontario legislature, Roman Baber, who has said things are so difficult right now with absenteeism, with sick leave and so on, 
we're just going to have to bite the bullet and invite those terminated hospital workers or long-term care workers back into the system because we need them, even if they're not vaccinated. What's your view on that? I'm completely for mandatory vaccinations. I think people take this out of context sometimes because the truth of the matter is the number or percentage of healthcare workers who have chosen not to be vaccinated is probably one to 2%. So we're not looking at a huge number here and to give them so much attention that I don't think is really frankly something that I feel like if they choose not to be vaccinated despite all of the evidence that's proving otherwise, that's a personal choice that they can make they're certainly welcome to work away from the bedside or in another industry. So I think it would be irresponsible to call these workers back knowing that they could be transmitting, you know, COVID at any given moment and even putting themselves and their families at risk is not something that I feel is a responsible decision. So I completely support the mandatory vaccinations. And I don't also feel it should be up to individual organizations to police this. It should be a mandatory uh, statement coming from the government to say that in certain industries that are very high risk, such as healthcare and especially long-term care, we need all workers to be vaccinated. Uh, I would love to hear all of you on that, but alas, we have run out of time. But I'm grateful to all of you for joining us here on TVO tonight. Peter Sherman, Sarah Fung, Dr. Peter Uni, and Jan De Silva. it's good of you to spend so much time with us here and help us out with this program tonight. Be well, everybody, and let's hope we're almost close to the end of this latest wave. Thanks for joining us. Thanks a lot. Thank you. In slightly more than a decade, cryptocurrency went from nothing to, well, something, but what is not easily explained. However, what is clear is that the virtual or digital money has developed an allure that draws people in in ways that even they have trouble explaining. Journalist and author Ethan Liu is among them. His new book chronicles his deep dive into that world. It's called Once a Bitcoin Miner, Scandal and Turmoil in the Cryptocurrency Wild West. And it brings Ethan Liu back to our virtual studio tonight from the downtown core of Ontario's capital city. Ethan, it's great to see you again. I enjoyed the book so much. How are you doing? I am well. Thank you for having me again, Steve. Not at all. I, um, I'm going to start from the premise that there are very few people watching us right now who can really truly explain and or understand what, for example, cryptocurrency or Bitcoin is. So we're going to throw this little explainer up and then we'll come back and chat after that. OK, Sheldon, if you would. In 2009, Bitcoin, the first cryptocurrency, was born. Bitcoin is digital, meaning there's no physical coin you can touch or hold. But it is different from the digital money you spend shopping online. Bitcoin is what is known as a decentralized digital currency. That means there are no banks, government, or other intermediaries overseeing these transactions. Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies run on blockchain technology. Think of blockchain as a database. Information is stored in blocks. This includes things like transfers and purchases. Once a block is full, it is linked to the previous block, creating a chain. All the blocks are connected chronologically, creating a chain that started in 2009 and continues to this day. So why does Bitcoin have value? The simple answer is people give it that value. They trust it. Currency can take many forms, but the properties of what is known as sound money are universal. Divisibility, durability, recognizability, portability, and scarcity. When we talk about the divisibility of fiat currency like Canadian dollars, we know that one dollar can be broken into 100 cents. In comparison, a Satoshi is the smallest unit of a Bitcoin, equivalent to 100 millionth of a Bitcoin. Unlike Canadian dollars, which are printed through the Bank of Canada, there is a limit on how many Bitcoins are available in the market. Only 21 million Bitcoins will ever be produced. Now, there are two popular ways of acquiring Bitcoin. You can purchase them online or at one of the 11,000 Bitcoin ATMs across Canada. Or you can do what is known as mining. No, you won't be needing a helmet and chisel for this type of excavating, but rather a powerful computer. The concept of mining isn't all that different from mining gold. As you help process transactions on the blockchain, you are rewarded with coins. One of the biggest advantage of cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin is that you can send large sums of money halfway across the world in a matter of 10 minutes. But what can you buy with it? 
While still limited, you can buy fast food, a hot cup of coffee, plane tickets to your next vacation, tickets to concerts, and sporting events. More recently, Tesla announced it would start accepting Bitcoin as a payment method for its products after buying $1.5 billion US in Bitcoin. Okay, thanks to Jay and Jagannathan for that explainer, and let's get to it. What got you, Ethan Liu, interested in Bitcoin to begin with? It's a very long story, and it began in uh, 2012, 2013, and that was when I first heard of Bitcoin. It was actually when my friends and I, we were just on the dark web for, I guess, no good reason. And that was my first time just fiddling about on the dark web. And I saw that uh, those dark web marketplaces, and this was this was back when Silk Road, the most infamous of them, was still running. And I saw that they were transacting with Bitcoin. That was the only medium of transaction allowed there. And from there, it did take me like a whole year to, to actually sink my money into Bitcoin. But that was the beginning. And what made it attractive for you? Mm -hmm. uh, well, at first, I, I could see that why people were using it on the dark web. Uh, it's because there's no central administrator to this. So how Bitcoin works is that it's entirely peer-to-peer. -peer. So those funds, theoretically, they can't be frozen, they can't be seized. And there is a, there is a certain attractiveness to that. And, and if you think beyond the dark web, there are lots of uh, other applications for that. And you can see that not only does it have value, other people are going to see that it has value. And of course, at the time, I didn't feel that to a 10, probably like a three or a four. And it, it was a gradual process. Okay, it can't be frozen or seized, but it can be hacked or stolen. Didn't that disturb you at all? Yeah, so I think the, the issue, and I think uh, something that, is, that could possibly be cleared up is that lots of times when people lose Bitcoin uh, or other cryptos due to hacks, it wasn't Bitcoin or other cryptos themselves that are hacked. It's uh, usually something else that is hacked. So for example, uh, the recent case of the the kid in Hamilton who uh, allegedly stole $46 million worth of crypto. Uh, he didn't he didn't hack the crypto. He, uh, he did a SIM swap. So he pretended uh, allegedly to, uh, to be someone else to the telco company and uh, thus uh, essentially stealing their identity. And from there, that's how uh, people uh, steal, steal crypto. And ultimately, the biggest feature of Bitcoin is also its biggest bug, that transactions are irreversible. So once stolen, it's gone. Well, that's what made me wonder about what a smart guy like you, who, who had a full-time job as a journalist and who's, you know, you've got a book under your belt, you're an author, what are you doing messing around on the dark web, looking for LSD, hanging out with some of these very shady characters? I mean, Ethan, come on. You're such a nice young man. What are you doing? <laughs> well, I, uh, I was a young man at the time. It was uh, just after my second year of university. So uh, I only finished university in like 2015. So, And uh, why do young men do what they do? It's the same reason that uh, people uh, climb tall piles of rock or ride raging farm animals just to see how long they can stay atop. Okay, I think that actually makes some sense. Now, you had a job, as I suggest, at, at the Reuters News Agency, your full-time journalist there, and then you quit. And I want to read an excerpt from the book here, which tells the story after that. You write, then almost instantly, I wanted more. And there was indeed more. Cryptocurrency had only been around since 2009. Everything was still in its infancy. Like everyone else I'd met, I had been seduced by this new world and its potential and opportunities. Later, when searching for a simple explanation for what I did next, I would cite this, that in that moment, when I came to truly understand my wealth, my heart had been filled and pierced with bewitchment and with desire for the enchanted gold beyond price and count. All right, let's get into this. How does mining cryptocurrency lead to the kind of wealth or financial comfort that apparently gave you enough comfort to quit a real full-time job? Mm -hmm. uh, well, so first of all, I would say uh, when I quit that job, I, I wouldn't uh, put it like how uh, someone strikes a lottery and then spends their time sailing all the time. I would uh, liken it more to, say, a lawyer quitting uh, a corporate job where he does mergers and acquisitions and then uh, goes on to uh, start his own firm and doing uh, cases that 
are more meaningful to him. So I know I still have a, I have a column in the Financial Post. I write in the Globe and the Star from time to time. So I have not left uh, my the actual career. It was just more of a changing of the employer. And mining didn't actually make me that much money. It was uh, it was that investment back in 2013. So when I first got into Bitcoin, that was. Uh, I, I bought it when it was as low as a thousand and as low as two hundred. So 2017, it went up to twenty thousand, and um, I don't have all of that money right now. But uh, at the time, I did have a lot. Yeah, you were a millionaire at one point, were you not? Yeah, that is correct, and that is uh, that's a pretty wild thing, eh? <laughs> That's how old were you when you were a millionaire? 27. I just turned 27, and I was just two years out of university. That's not too bad. But at a certain point, you did get, what did you get, bored of mining cryptocurrency? Or how would you describe what overcame you? Hmm. Uh, well, and I, I think lots of things, uh, they are never just one thing, a uh, multitude of factors. And one of the reasons I started mining was also as a, as a vehicle for this book. And I had been thinking of writing this book for a long time, I think ever since 2014. And, you know, one of the things you have to put in a book proposal is, why are you the person to write this book? And for the longest time, I could not answer that question. And uh, mining was, uh, was a way to, uh, to answer that question. And as I focus more on the book, I sort of wrap that up. Do you have a better answer for the question now? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and I think ultimately, uh, I think uh, what people search for when they go into this world of cryptocurrency, it's also what people search for when they uh, lust after the Wild West back in those days. Uh, they're searching for freedom and adventure. And back then, I, I want to say back then I was very young. I'm still very young now. And I think me, people like me, uh, I think we are searching for those things. Well, you pointed out you do write for some other publications still, and you did write in the Globe and Mail that Bitcoin evokes that long-standing phenomenon we know as the frontier myth. How does it do that? Uh, well, uh, I think I'm not the first person to make that comparison. I think lots of people have compared Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, this world, to the Wild West. But where our conclusions differ is that I don't consider the comparison to be an insult. I think uh, while the actual Wild West is full of injustice, colonialism, and brutality, the idea of the West, uh, what, uh, what beckons people there, that is very positive. Uh, why do people go to the West in the past? Because it offers freedom and it op offers opportunity and riches. But more important than that, in the Wild West, you are free from the societal hierarchies back home. You know, how things are structured in normal society may not matter that much in the West. And I think the world of crypto is very much like that. And people seeking it what people sought in the West back then. So there is, in your view, a, a kind of a typical crypto personality that might be particularly attracted to that world. Is that fair to say? Oh, yeah, uh, absolutely. And but I think the world is diverse and we all have a lot of differences, but I think uh, the, underneath all that, uh, everyone in it has, does have something very similar because uh, when I went to North Korea for that crypto conference, uh, right before then, I met a whole bunch of the other attendees. We had nothing in common, but uh, the first thing a guy said to me was, why did you decide to do this outlandish thing of going to North Korea? And uh, my only response was, well, what about you? And we all just laughed, and we never really addressed that. But I think we knew we shared something in an unspoken way. Well, as a matter of fact, that is question eight on my list here. Why in heaven's name would you go to North Korea? You sort of answered it right now. But, um, well, let's put it this way. Admittedly, you're a bit of a, a child of the world, right? You're born in China, but you grew up in West Germany. And now here you are in North Korea. Did it, did it at any point occur to you that that might not be the smartest thing in the world to do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so firstly, uh, why I decided to go to North Korea, other than the crypto aspect, uh, because uh, North Korea was holding a cryptocurrency conference, it was also that um, I think of North Korea as a time capsule, because when I always tell my parents of how weird North Korea is, they would say, it's not weird, this is the China in which I grew up. But over the years, China has changed a lot, and North Korea has remained rather stagnant. So I've always thought that if I can go to North Korea, I can sort of see how my parents grew up 
and I've long wanted to go to North Korea. And when the crypto conference came, that was uh, that I, I was like, I have to go. And and also, I should say that uh, North Korea, it's before the pandemic, at least, it has opened it, itself to tourism. Lots of people uh, go there all the time. And so while it may not seem like a normal thing to do, it's not, in my view, at least completely outlandish. Well, it may be that more people are going there, but if I read your book uh, correctly, there's a lot more people who are trying to get out of there right now. Uh, how, as you look back on the experience now, um, would you advise other people to go to North Korea? Hmm. Well, I would say, um, I guess probably yes. It, I think it depends on your your personal risk tolerance, and I, I actually don't see why not. And but uh, probably not in the pandemic because they've they've suspended these tours. But uh, if they if they ever come back again, these are legitimate tourism companies, and they, they take you there. And generally, I, I I would think of it as quite safe. Well, let me ask you about a high-profile figure in the cryptocurrency world, a man by the name of Virgil Griffith, who was on the same trip as you. What happened to him? Mm -hmm. Well, he uh, he got arrested. So uh, maybe to uh, to uh, address that previous question again, if you're American, it'll probably be a good idea not to go to North Korea because uh, he he was he had the ill fate of being born an American, and Americans they can't go to North Korea after someone went there, got detained, and and later died. So uh, he he not only so, oh he wasn't allowed to go, he sought permission to go, he was denied, and so. They were clearly watching him from the beginning, and then he gave a speech there, and he's accused of uh, imparting technical advice to North Korea uh, with respect to crypto and uh, with respect to uh, evading sanctions, and he pleaded guilty in uh, September of this year. Let me raise another guy who is a, a big player in your book, and his name is Jan Serato, uh, with whom you, you actually uh, publish in the back of your book. Uh, a lengthy email exchange that the two of you had. Uh, you seemed quite balanced during the course of it. He seemed quite, well, I'm not sure what word to use, but d d distracted, I guess, is, a, is a, a gentle way of describing the way that his emails uh, seemed to you. Uh, okay, talk to me about your relationship with him and, and um, how it ended up. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it was actually a, a text exchange. But yeah, my relationship with him, I, I first came across him when uh, I, I went to this crypto meetup in Calgary and it was branded as a workshop. But when I walked in, uh, they were people clearly selling a scam. There was this guy, he literally quoted the Bible. He said, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. And that project was eventually sued by the uh, SEC in the US. And I should say Jan Serato's side of the story that he would later say he had nothing at all to do with the event, but he was listed as the organizer of the event. So that was when I first came across him. And he would be involved in a case in the book, which is now before the Alberta Securities Commission. And again, his side of the story is that in that case, he had only uh, a minimal role and he was, uh, he was just the marketing guy and not the ringleader. But uh, from the from what sources tell me and from what I write in the book, uh, the records that I have seen and what the ASC is accusing him of, he ran this uh, illegal investing club and people basically gave them their money and uh, he would, uh, or the club would invest it uh, on their behalf in various cryptocurrencies. It was called the Whale Club. And ultimately, it was a case of the blind leading the blind. And lots of people lost lots of money. Are you one of them? Uh, no. I, I, I think from the beginning, I did not think of that as something I would put my money into, that it was indeed a, a little suspicious. But 2017, let me tell you, that was a, that was a wild time. That was uh, Bitcoin went from a thousand to twenty thousand. All sorts of projects were entering, and all sorts of people were claiming all sorts of expertise. And the interesting thing is that you didn't need to know what you were doing to make money because everyone's a genius in the bull market. <laughs> but uh, when the crypto winter comes, uh, yeah, the, it came for everyone. In our last couple of minutes here, I guess one of the things that helped me understand cryptocurrency was the notion that. 
that, you know, air miles is a kind of a currency. Aeroplan points are a kind of a currency. You know, you collect them and you spend them. And, and cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, I guess, is the same kind of thing. Uh, my question for you is, now that you've looked into this so much and spent so much time on it, do you think that cryptocurrency is going to become, as air miles and aeroplan points have, do you think it's going to become more mainstream and everyday people are going to be into this in a big way? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think, uh, yeah, you can definitely draw the comparison between Bitcoin and air miles, but there is a big difference there in that air miles, it, uh, whether you have it, how you spend it, it depends on the benevolence of the, the company controlling it. And I would, uh, I would tell you the story about Bitcoin that uh, I love telling. It illustrates, I think, in the best way its uh, use case. So in Afghanistan, uh, back when the Taliban were taking over and when refugees tried to flee, and they all, most of them, uh, they can't leave with their, with their money. They leave often penniless because of how bad their financial infrastructure is and how bad their currency is. But there was this young lady I've heard who had Bitcoin and she, it was a harrowing journey for her out of Afghanistan. She had to cross Iran and Turkey and her ship sank in the Mediterranean. But when she landed in Germany, she effectively, uh, when you memorize your passphrase, you effectively just carry Bitcoins in your head. And so she was able to use two Bitcoins to fund a new life in Germany. And I think at the end of the day, uh, our financial infrastructure uh, we take a lot of these things for granted, but we forget how how fragile they are and how quickly they can fade away. But Bitcoin, at its heart, it's, a, it's an anti-fragile version of that. Hmm. Well, it is a fascinating and dramatic story, and it's well told in Once a Bitcoin Miner, Scandal and Turmoil in the Cryptocurrency Wild West, and it's brought Ethan Liu to our virtual studio tonight from downtown Toronto in uh, Ontario's capital city. And Ethan, it's been good to see you again. Stay well, okay? Always a pleasure. And that is the agenda for Wednesday, January 12, 2022. Tomorrow, a look at the daily reality for older men facing homelessness. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.